Okay, you get to mm -hmm. So, hey, I'm Nathan. I use uh, Temple OS as my daily driver, as I was showing you earlier. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I think I was introduced to Linux with Hannah Montana Linux. So, no, actually, seriously, um, I think I got into <laughs> Linux about 11 or 12 years ago uh, when I had a, like a netbook had a whole 8 gigabytes on it, and I was kind of playing around with Windows, and I was wondering, like, why can't I just really control my system? Like, why is there an administrator, but you have to, like, elevate to NT authority system? So I kind of wanted to have full control of my, my OS, so I looked into Linux, and I kind of learned what you could do with Ruby on Linux, and I, I don't know, I, I learned demand pages, I read demand pages, and that's how I got here. So. Yeah, as I said, my name is Nathan Nye. Uh, my GitHub username is NoProto. I currently work at web.com, which is a web hosting company here in Jacksonville. It's headquartered here. And this is my second meeting for Jack's Lug. And I've, I've hacked a few places. Uh, I'm like, I, I do like ethical hacking uh, in my free time, and I do bug bounty programs, so. Uh, there are a few different organizations I've done reports to, and um, most of my time these days is kind of dedicated to my, my, my day job, and also this software that I'm going to give you guys kind of like an early preview of it. Um, it's, it's all open source, so that's, that, that's the good news. It, it's still, I'm still fleshing out all the details, so if you have any like criticism or construction criticism of my, my project, Please just yell it out. Like I, I, I would appreciate the feedback of um, you know because it, it's it's still being uh, created. So I changed the introduction of my presentation to this uh, because it's it's kind of timely. And so um, obviously I can't go into what happened during this this incident here. But um, what I can say about it is. This so during this incident that happened, the place at work, um, we knew the path, we knew like how you can get through the network, we knew the vulnerabilities that they were going to use, and we also detected them within an hour of them accessing the critical infrastructure. So we had pretty good response, in my opinion. Um, so that kind of leads me into asking. What do you guys think went wrong in that situation? If we had pretty much given all of these these good factors, what do you think we could have done possibly differently? Time and closing the vulnerabilities. Yeah, that's 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 <laughs> definitely one for sure. Any any other uh, guesses? Were the vulnerabilities you could have easily patched? Uh, some of them were. Uh, uh, automating closing the path, or automating some kind of memory. automating some kind of response segmentation. I mean, I mean there, there's segmentation as well, isolation. So now we're okay. Yeah, there's actually multiple answers for this, and hopefully I got the first two points there. <laughs> but um, yeah, so the third one there is kind of introspecting, like, okay, well, what could security have done to prevent this from working? And that's partially, you know, my interest in, in uh, EDR tools. It's kind of like a, a new market, uh, which is like uh, these are tools to detect hacks and um, also sometimes to block them. And so <laughs> I'm just going to give you guys kind of a demonstration of a Linux system that has backdoors. Has anyone, just so I know my audience here, how many of you guys know what LD preload is? Okay, wow. Preload? LD preload. LD preload. So environmental variable. Cool. I'm, I'm actually surprised. I've used it for reverse engineering purposes before. Yeah, that's that's what I use it for most of the time. <laughs> so also controlling weird behavior. Like F your random number generator. It's now, consistently returns to the number 42. You <laughs> will get there. <laughs> so, here I have a 
Actually, let me blow this up a little bit so you guys can see it. That'd be good. Thank you. <laughs> You know what this right here is good at blowing stuff up? Gentoo. <laughs> 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 right, these are here. Can you guys see that? Do I need much, to make much better? A little bit better. Okay. But okay. only have you to compile it. So here I have a server that I will tell you is backdoor. And what do you guys think I should look for? to find that backdoor. Do you, do you have any ideas of where I might look to identify a backdoor on the system? Let's see password. Yep. Sorry. That's fair. Maybe check the process list in NetSat. Oh, you already know what the answer is. <laughs> okay, so we'll do one at a time. We'll do the, the process, mm -hmm. the, you know, we'll do PSLX after this, and then also uh, NetSat. And so right now I'm seeing just nothing but standard user accounts. Some uh, ethereal ports that seem to be open. Did, what did you say? Some ethereal ports. Um, there's no ephemeral ports in this. This is the password file on Linux. So this is just user accounts. And yep, I don't see anything that looks out of ordinary. I'm just gonna go down to the end of the file. That's what there is. I will literally well, it's just got show System you. D. That's what your problem is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I depended on the System D to protect me here. So, yeah, actually, the, the, the program I wrote is going to be integrated into System D. No, I'm kidding. So, there are, so you're, you're actually going to user accounts. <laughs> Dan just thought, well, I'm never going to see in. You're all user accounts in the system okay. with the passwords, uh, the shadow hashes, and uh, you can see there's no password assigned to any account. <clears throat> and not that there's no password, but it's just like you, you can't log in yep. with a password. Okay. Um, We'll do a PSOX. I'm going to show some tree structure here. It's a little bit hard to read in this format. There we go. So we just have the regular like kernel rocks, and then we have, I mean, not, nothing particularly stands out to me in this process tree, unless anyone disagrees. Okay. So, also we can look at that stat. What does that thing have a bot on it? What was that? There was something on the PS. Maybe you can look. Oh, it's a goodie. And the system D looks suspicious. Yeah. <laughs> Let's kill it. <laughs> do it. <laughs> Hackers can't get in if you do that. <laughs> All right, so. Um, that's the name of my system, so don't freak out. <laughs> that's actually just me connecting to this box. So there's one SSH connection open, and other than that, it's listening on NTP. And there's there's an ODA right there named Jarvis. <laughs> yeah, that's my my uh, my bastion host. So it's just me connecting to the box. Um, the TCP connections don't seem to indicate any like anything we're listening on other than NTP and SSH, which is pretty standard out of the box. Why are you listening on NTP? Yeah. Uh, it's just so... Well, it's not listening, it's just... It's not listening. It's NTP right? daemon, and... It, it's not listening, though. It's just running. Oh, you're right. You're right, it's not listening. Okay, so the only port that is listening is is SSH. <coughs> okay, yeah, good good point. So the only thing that's externally listening is SSH, so I think we can kind of rule this out as a you know, a listening port or something. The list of files are just basically system D and stuff, so are there any other ideas where we can look for a backdoor? On your file system for badly uh, um, sticky bitted uh, materials? Okay, so we can do one at a time. We'll just do find port slash perm minus 6000, which will give us all SUID files. Uh, and also, let's do two at the middle. We want to find oh, things that are not owned by 
Yeah, yeah Python's 2.7, that's in the light, that's what it is. <laughs> oh, wait, let's, let's just limit it to files, not directories, because only the files can use it. You need it really desperately. So this is the list. Um, if you're unfamiliar, this is pretty standard for what you would see. Uh, has a SUID or SGID bit. Um, and we can look at LSMOD2, which is a good place to look, by the way. And we have all these dangerous things like IRQ by... No, I that. <laughs> That's all pretty normal, too. What, what, what's in CronTab? Okay, we could look at ground tab as well. Maybe, maybe, maybe something's not running right now and uh, it's set up for systems for later. Far spool cron. Okay, cron tabs. <coughs> Nothing in cron tab. <laughs> Any other ones? Right. Any other guesses? Right. Could, also, cron. could also be your uh, SSH allowed keys or host allowed. Very mm -hmm. true. So let's see what allowed keys there are. <laughs> Just my bachelor host. Okay. Quick, quick, quickly jot that down. <laughs> I mean, it's a public key, oh, yeah. so yeah, let's go ahead. <laughs> it's okay, we're recording it. Mm -hmm. It's fine, it's a public key. Public. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'll, I'll kind of spoil it now. So, it is actually a LD preload group kit. And I'll just demonstrate it real fast. So here we have the IP address of the server. And as we know, there are no backdoor users and SE password, but I'm going to do SSH jacks log at that IP. Password. It's very secret. I'm not going to tell you guys. So you don't arm arm with me while I'm doing this. <laughs> <laughs> and represented a root shell. So, as you can see, like this is not a different system. This is the same system. There's no Etsy password entry for Jack's log. Uh, it's it's all pretty indetectable, and or rather undetectable. So. That kind of just introduces us to, to rootkits. So what would your invite, like if you were to run the environment command there, would it show any exported L, LD yeah. preloads or anything like that? Do you see any? No. So one of the things that they hide is also any any suspicious indicators that the rootkit yeah, would be present. Because that's kind of what a rootkit does. We can go into that in a second. Um, but there is actually a file that allows you to control LD preload across the entire system. And um, I, I'll go into, if, you're, if you don't know what LD preload is, I'm going to go into it in just a second. Um, but there's, just to specifically answer your question, there is a file that allows you to control LD preload across the system. Not just an environment variable, there's a file. If you look it up in the man pages, yeah. uh, I'll that so. Probably a bad place to look. So let me just go to a different window here. Uh, let's see, LD, that's so. There's a file. Oh, okay. I didn't actually know about that. Yeah, so getting back to the, uh, the topic. Can anyone answer this question? What is a rootkit? A rootkit is any sort of malware that exploits and subverts your OS. It's designed to try to hide itself by actually hooking and interrupting any sort of API that it could be querying. So you, at that point, lose the integrity of the system. You can't trust it anymore, to be honest with you. Right. Any other, mm -hmm. anyone else want to try to explain what a rootkit is? Nope. Okay. So I, I put a definition here just so that it be referenced. So a rootkit is a set of software tools that enable kind of like an unauthorized user to gain control of the computer system without being detected. So I'm going to go into the kind of like a brief history of rootkits on Linux systems. So the earliest rootkits that existed were uh, like log cleaners. <coughs> Um, early CentOS kits, have been, and there was actually some initial rootkits that were written around this time. And it was really limited in the ability to hide 
and it was pretty much just limited to, to simple back doors. So it might be a program that listens on port 22222, and then when you connect to it, it drops you a shell, right, as root. That's what I'm talking about here. Uh, another, another, well, another program would be, uh, actually, let me go with this when I get into the, to a little bit further into the rootkit history. So, the next kind of category of rootkits that came out were the LKM rootkits. And as you kind of acutely mentioned, you can look for uh, suspicious kernel modules um, that might be loaded on our system. And the kernel modules, what they do is they, you know, they're loaded into ring zero, so they're loaded into the kernel. And because they're in the kernel, they control what the kernel tells you. So pretty foolproof, right? I mean, if you're in the kernel, you tell you know you tell the user space anything, and I mean that's just the fact. So the nice thing about LKM loadable kernel modules is that you can now target all Linux distributions, and you can hide. Whereas before, like the log cleaners uh, and the mm -hmm. their initial rootkits, um, you couldn't. You couldn't really hide. It was more just like just targeted file editing and things that you know. So it, it didn't do a very good job of, of hiding the hackers on the systems. Um, the only drawback for LKM is that you have to compile it with the, ser the, the server's headers. So like literally the Linux headers that are for that distribution, you have to compile it for that distro which you might not have the headers on that box yet, or you might not have a compiler even. Sometimes, you know, when you build systems in production, it's a good idea not to give everyone a compiler to just compile any program that they want in the system. Um, if you try to load a LKM rootkit and it's not compatible, it will kernel panic. So your system will just, I mean, either it will say that it's incompatible, or there is an implicit incompatibility that it won't warn you about, and then your kernel will panic, and then you know the hacker loses access to the system. So that's obviously pretty bad for the hackers, right? They don't want to just lose access to their system just because they're trying to install some method of persistence. So that brings us into some, some, somewhat closer to the modern day. You have user space rootkits. And the user space rootkits obviously didn't touch the kernel, and I can elaborate a little bit more on them. So just for the reliability uh, of the rootkit, you basically replaced all the binaries on the system, and uh, sometimes there was incompatibility there. I mean, obviously not all Linux distributions are the same. So if you try to use your static a version of, of Bash, sure, it, it might work across different Linux distributions, but maybe there was a certain feature that was on an earlier version of Bash or a different version of Bash that was compiled for that distribution, and now that you replaced it, now some other build script breaks or something. So it's not perfect. Um, then they can also kind of trivially discover uh, the rootkits with just generic programs, right? So instead of calling the infected version of Bash, you could just have a program, you can put a program on the system that makes those syscalls by itself. And because the kernel is safe, you could just, you know, hey, is, is Bash okay? And you could just read the file in, get a hash, and then that'll tell you whether or not you're infected. So user space rootkits, Definitely more generic and more reliable. Sure. It's going to ask, would something like Tripwire catch something like that? Absolutely, yes. Yes. Yeah, Tripwire, um, I think it runs a daemonized process in user space, but because it's using uh, different, so because the, the kernel itself is not hooked, mm -hmm. Tripwire can see that this user space rootkit would be installed. This specific type of user <laughs> um, Tripwire will not see loadable kernel modules installed. Thank you. It's, you know, if the 
LS mod kind of syscalls are hooked, it won't be able to actually see that. So it could possibly detect the module on the file though. Like if they detect file system changes, like the modules on disk it would detect that. It would detect the loading aspect. Yes. So what you could do is you could shut down your system and then look through the file system and that would tell you for sure. Uh, yeah, that was the old fashioned way of proof kit detection. <laughs> Get a list of all the files on the system in the live system, churn it off, boot it up in something else, get it up from there, compare the differences between the files. If you mm. didn't notice any files that are showing up on the offline that were not on the online, those are suspicious. Mm. So the problem with that is that you have to shut down a production system. And it takes a while, yes. So if you don't have a mirror image of that system, you have to copy it, and then you have to shut down the production system, Review the production system, not even guaranteed to really find whatever it is, because there's different types of rootkits and different pathways that they infect. But it kind of boils down to this. Um, so it's not the most convenient way, but it is foolproof. So yes, there is that. And this is modern day, even though it says 2011. This is currently what they use to backdoor the systems in the most generic and reliable way possible. They use LD preload to backdoor the systems. And the first rootkit that was released uh, that, was, that used this new design was called uh, Jinx. And Jinx <laughs> it had some problems. Um, it sometimes caused all the uh, programs on the operating system to segfault. So, <laughs> That wasn't ideal. They came out with Jinx 2, and then since then they've come out with Azazel. Um, they came out with uh, two other LD preload root kits, but uh, those are the public ones. There's also private ones called Umbreon, and you can go online and read about these root kits, but it's, it's very common today to see LD preload root kits. <laughs> and the reason why is because they're in user space, so we're not touching the kernel, we don't have to compile anything. It's just this generic, as long as it matches the architecture of the operating system, you know, we're good. As long as we can just put it inside the directory and install it globally. So, I'm, this is the slide I actually um, explained to you what uh, LA Preload is. So, what LA Preload is, and this is <laughs> exactly what you were mentioning earlier, right? This is a very simple, and this is an entire LD preload library. This is all the source code that you actually need to write to compile it. Just all you do is you uh, compile it as a, a shared object library with GCC. And then, oh, here it is. Here's the command. And I use LD preload. I use a ZSH. And I call ZSH's uh, random function. And all it does is return four when I say load this library. So, What's actually going on here? Well, the way that dynamic binaries work on Linux, which is like 95% of all the binaries that you run on Linux, the way they work is they look for libraries <coughs> in the library search path, path, which is usually like lib, lib64, lib32, user lib. Uh, it looks for libraries. And one of those libraries is glibc. And the, the new libc library, GNU libc library, uh, it provides uh, APIs to interface with the operating system syscalls. And so one of those syscalls is RAND. And if I overwrite that, LD preload makes sure that I'm first in line for whatever functions you want to call in your program. So usually it goes to LD pre usually it goes to glibc and glibc is like, hey, here's your secure random function. But if I define the environment variable LD preload or I install it globally, as we mentioned, using a certain file, that program will instead go to me first. And I've used this in the past same, same, same way that you used it for reverse engineering programs. Uh, internally, those programs are probably going to call the operating system APIs at some point. 
So if you hook things like uh, STR copy or STR CMP, uh, you would actually get all of the system calls. And you can use a, uh, another function, uh, DLSYM. I can't pronounce that, but... <laughs> dynamic symbols, what that's supposed to stand for. It's, so that way you can dynamically look up another symbol. And since you're doing it from your address space, it's actually going to the <coughs> next instance of it. Exactly. Which is the real one. Right. So it's cool is that you can hook and then actually like do whatever you want with that data and then pass it to the real one. Right. So you're just you're you're just kind of inserting yourself in the middle of the whole process here. So it's going to libraries, it's trying to run whatever random function it wants, but you kind of you know insert yourself in the middle of that process. You take the input, you do whatever you want with it. You can either just get it back or you can just pass it on to the real one, and then it'll call that function, and then it will return the value as expected. So it's a really powerful primitive. You can use it to reverse engineer programs, or you know, backdoor systems. So security tools actually followed a parallel history. Um, a lot of security is kind of like Bad guys do one thing, we learn about that thing, we create mitigations for it, and then we're you know back on the same the same level. So the initial security tools that used to be released for Linux um, were some of them are you know date back pretty far, but they're still available present day, like like Tripwire and like uh, CH Rootkit, Rootkit Hunter. These are just generic utilities, sometimes even shell scripts that you just run and it does a, a you know, broad range of checks in user space and um, did you have a question? Okay. Uh, it just does a broad range of checks and it tries to figure out if you're, you have a rootkit on your system or if you have a backdoor or something. And it can also detect some pretty trivial backdoors too like if someone decides to add another user account with user ID zero on your system It'll show up in that list, and, and then Rootkit Hunter will tell you, hey, there's a new unauthorized user account, and it'll mail you and all that. So these were the initial tools that were developed to combat Linux malware, which exists, whether or not, <laughs> whether or not you believe it or not. No. <laughs> Magically um, impenetrable viruses. <laughs> so there was an improvement upon that. Um, when we... Well, don't want to get too far ahead of myself. So there were uh, kernel patches. So if, if we're trying to make a parallel here, I would say it's the first Linux rootkits. Um, the kernel patches in, in GR security. Does anyone here use GR security? You used to when I was doing You do? Uh, actually, I've had things that ran it, like they kind of went back out of themselves. Oh, they just run it? Okay. Yeah, I would, I would see it like GR security running. Like, oh, I didn't know I had that. <laughs> Yeah, so GR Security is a Linux patch, and what it does is it tries to, at the, it sacrifices your usability of the Linux system in favor of security. So it locks down a lot of the uh, Linux APIs and devices and procfs and you know it's pretty much everything that kind of gives Linux a lot of its flavor. It locks it all down, and so. Sometimes that introduces breaking changes, and the one of the cornerstones of Linux is that you don't break user space, you don't change it significantly, and then just break user space programs, because that's the responsibility of the kernel maintainers to not do that. And um, very well to that, you have System D. Yeah, <laughs> I, was, I was thinking that. Well, it, it is a it is a user space program, so. Um, Generally, as long as user space is okay, it's great. Uh, GR security, even though it implements a lot of good features for security, it also breaks user space in some respects. And so you've got to be willing to make that trade off, and you have to compile all your kernels across the board. Yeah, it's a large scale. Didn't I get a license to And <laughs> shut down your production systems. So. <laughs> so. <clears throat> Did you can, security go license a while back? 
What was that? Didn't GR Security go license a while back? The company that behind it, there was like a whole rift between them. Uh, Intel, Intel was selling it through Wind River, and they didn't like not getting royalties about it, so they pulled it from open source space. Was it Intel? Mm -hmm. Well, Intel owns Wind River, and Wind River was the offender. Oh, really? Yeah. So there's a whole bunch of drama. So <laughs> it, 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 just got, it just got from a lot of open source kernels, and now you got to like go to the company and like justify your use and purchase licenses to it, and just it was, right, it was unfortunate. Yeah, there there is a lot of differing opinions when it comes to kernel development. Uh, the guy who develops Jira Security is not on the same page as Linus. Well, you know, he he's he's uh, you can look him up. Spender. He he's uh, kind of opposed to a lot of the changes that take place in Linux kernel. And there are a lot of new features that, I mean, technically you could just remove the features, but he tries to introduce more secure versions of them. The, the, the drawback of this method, which you can certainly, if you want to, you can compile all your kernels, shut down all your systems, and you can get them all on GR security. The drawback of this is that you can't block programs from running. So, yeah, you can stop exploits like kernel zero days from happening, but you can't stop the programs themselves from running. So there have been instances where GR security has had vulnerabilities, and then, you know, that that kind of compromises that stack, so. And you had to mess with a lot of binaries for stuff, too, like with packs and stuff. What was that? I said you had to mess with a lot of the binaries, too, to give permissions. Like, for example, with Java, we had to do pack stuff with Java to get to run under GL security controls. It would break a lot of different stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, like I said, user space breaks. <laughs> so, today, Today, security tools use literal kernel modules. So we've already discussed literal kernel modules when we made, went through this history here. That's the response to the security community was, you know, you have things like Adore, which I've actually personally used before. And Adore was a great global kernel module rootkit. We need uh, some way to detect um, literal kernel module backdoors. We have to protect. Uh, rather, the kernel modules should be loaded to begin with. We have to guarantee the file integrity of the the the, uh, <coughs> the source code itself, so the the, the the KO files, the kernel modules. So anyway, this is today. We have loadable kernel modules, and so the problem with loadable kernel modules, it, there is a couple. You said loadable kernel modules. Yes. yes. Okay, I just want to make sure I was hearing you right. Yes. Okay. I'm. And they have the same issues as LKM rootkits, and actually a few more issues. So one of the problems is that it adds to the attack surface of the kernel. Anytime you introduce new code to the kernel, and you know, the Linux kernel is pretty battle-tested, right? It's, it's been around for 30, no, 20, 20 years or so, right? Probably. <laughs> Basically, many eyes, right? 90, 90, he, he was there. <laughs> right there when, when the first version was pushed. Right next to the line is good. <laughs> you, you forgot a semicolon. <laughs> Fair program, anything. It's been, it's been around for a while, and a lot of the major exploits have been declining over time. You can look through. Uh, security vulnerabilities in Linux, and you can see over time it goes like this, right? So we're benefiting from the many eyes principle, right? So a lot of people are seeing the software, and they're seeing the source code, and they're trying to find ways to subvert or, or use unintended functionality or race conditions. So you know, that we, we get the benefit of the Linux kernel being secure, but when you have a, a third-party company that doesn't publish their source code, uh, you know, just give you these, these kernel modules to load, you got to trust them that they're secure. And I can't say which ones. <laughs> Would yeah. a device driver count as a loadable kernel module? Yes. yes. Okay. Hey, no, man. Pay no mention to the man behind the curtain. <laughs> yeah, just should... load this blob into your kernel. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. So it's binary binary firmware. Yeah, so there are proprietary drivers and whatnot that are kind of kernel modules. Uh, so the, the, at the end of the day, these are security modules that are designed to keep your system safe, but 
you know, that's not always the case. And like I said, I can't name which which vendors do this, but certain people might know in this audience, but <laughs> there is a leading enterprise software, <laughs> enterprise EDR software that, you know, is designed to keep the system safe, but in fact it introduced our root global privilege escalation vulnerability through the software and also, there's some real co-execution issues, and that's throughout their entire product. I mean, we, we found, at web.com, we found, I would say, about 10 vulnerabilities off the bat. I think it was like 8 to 10 that we initially reported, and that took six months. <laughs> and then, on top of that, you've got the, um, the vulnerabilities that we found right after that, which they didn't do a sufficient fix. So, yeah, how does SE Linux fit into all of this? SE Linux is kind of like GR security, but it's, it's, it's part of the kernel. Um, you do have kind of hurdles to, to implement it correctly. And then you have a lot of exploits that are designed specifically to just disable SE Linux. <laughs> so, you know, your awesome SE Linux policy probably won't help you when the kernel exploit runs. And I mean, it'll, it's designed, it's, it's, it's better access. It's okay, it's just logging anyways. What was that? It's okay, it's just set the logging anyways. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people, yeah. for, for well, no... Just turn it off. <laughs> that's exactly what most people do. <laughs> so, anyway. It's so, fine, I don't read the logs anyway, so... <laughs> that's why it needs to be enforced. You don't have to read the logs. <laughs> so, yeah, I... I'm, I'm, you know, someone in security, and I kind of look at all this happening, and I see this kind of like, okay, we're making a better version of this to respond to this threat, and it seems like the next logical step here is LD preload, right? Because that's what the hackers did. After they made the LKM rootkits, they switched to LD preload because it was more reliable, and you know, it, it's it's wider in scope. So we can. So the the, the real. Okay. I'm Maybe sorry. This, this LD preload basically it lets you insert your own libraries, and then when people use programs or compile, now they're using your code. But why does it let you? Let, let's say you're you're not a root user. Why would it let your code that you're inserting have root privileges? So. Do you want to is that a that? silly question or is uh, it no? Uh, so now also that it is worth noting that you can only inject LD preload into a process that is running as your user. You mm -hmm. cannot do this against a root thing. Yes. However, as you pointed out, you can put a file that will LD preload globally, and at that point, I think that's going to include root, which means that whenever sysd and init d or whatever you have is loading all the services and stuff, those are getting tainted as well. But yeah, why, but why, to, why is that allowed? You to actually put it into that. Right. So, yeah, like, let's say that we had, like, an so SU. have to have an escalation bug. So it's actually kind of and interesting. Is like, say that we had a set UID binary that should run as root, sure. and I did an LD preload, it's actually going to run as myself. It will not run as root, which will, will likely break that program if it needed yeah. root for some reason. But it's kind of a safety precaution to stop you from doing things. It's the same thing, like, whenever you use GDB, it's going to run it as me and not as root because it obviously doesn't want me to just go in there, edit memory, and then run. <laughs> what, what if you sudo sue, and then when you're in root, sudo run sudo, sudo again? Sudo is a set user ID binary. Yeah, so it wouldn't work. Um, any set user ID binary, off limits. You cannot load your LE preload, unless it's the global hook. Unless it's the global one, so the you cannot one? use the, yeah, the, yeah only okay. if you, you can only use the file one for that. The environment one is only for your own program. It seems like you did that because of the SSH DMA being tainted. I did what? Uh, with your example from earlier, because it seems to me like it was the SSH server that got hooked. Yep. So okay. exactly. Yeah, it was using running it right. Yeah. Yeah. So am I correct in saying you, you have to be root before you can run LD preload? No, you no. can still do a lot of stuff even as yourself. <coughs> so LD preload is a feature. It's not a bug. So it's supposed to it's supposed to have some functionality to be able to prevent things from doing what they want to do. It's 
basically think of it like a fork in the river and you're saying, hey, don't take the fork that you want to take. Come over here and use these programs and these resources instead. And there are legitimate uses for like LD preload. Like for example, like let's say that I've got a program. I could build a debugging library and have it inject that in there to give me more information if I'm trying to debug something without replacing the system libraries. It, it can actually be used in that sort of context. I'm you not also, arguing with LD also, preload. Um, I've had to like compile programs that you know, they need different libraries in the system has yeah. because yeah. it's ancient or it's like something that, you know, it's just because not supported you're anymore or, you know, somebody's, uh, usually it's on Debian systems actually. Debian uh, <laughs> <laughs> systems just work. Just because uh, they're your lag on, on, on updating. Um, and uh, you use LD preload to just basically like, oh, you, you want, you, you know, this particular library set, it's over here and not over there. It just seems but, weird that they'd have something that would allow you to give yourself more privileges. Oh. It well, doesn't well, allow you to replace have things in stream. You would have and to have room to modify the global file first. Exactly. Yeah. So you have to escalate, and then you can do that. And okay. then you have a rootkit pay for Yeah, and then you would have your persistence. Uh, right. This Perfect. is a persistence. Yeah. This is more a about persistence. It's more about you have to already get there before you can do anything else. This isn't a privilege escalation. This is a persistence. Well, it was once. Oh, uh, yeah. They <laughs> all build uh, Project Zero there. So. Yeah, that, that's a different, um, another feature of, of LD Preload is LD Library Path, which tells you, like, hey, I want to load libraries from this folder. And uh, if you've ever used, like, SQL Plus, you've had to do that. So, so yeah, there's, there's many different parts of this. Spe specifically, that zero day was actually caused by LD Audit. The uh, new Lucy developers forgot to blacklist that one when it comes to SUID binaries, so they just said like, okay, I'll de audit this, and then they were able to get root easily. So that was probably the most reliable root. That one was place. great, yeah. It worked <laughs> everywhere. Yeah, you, 2012. Yeah, that was, that, that, was a, time. that was a great year. <laughs> <laughs> From the chess collection was so simple. So the break, the, the, the kind of like the, the different mentality here is we can actually protect systems with LD preload rather than backdooring them. And fun fact, I actually knew the guy who made Jinx, and I talked with him because he kind of pioneered a lot of this, uh, a lot of these techniques, uh, but more for like black hat side. <laughs> and so I talked with him, and I, I explored this, and I said, you know, what if we use LD preload to inject into all uh, processes globally? And it's faster than p-tracing every process on the system, which would be really slow. And I said, you know, what if we use LD preload here? Then I can actually stop the programs from running because I can hook exec VE. You know, exec, basically all the exec calls in Linux, you can hook into them all with LD preload. And we went back and forth for a few hours, and it was like, oh, crap, this actually can work. <laughs> so that's how I, that, that kind of led into, you know, the idea of making white beam. And... So I have created like a design to a secure design that's that's kind of built around LD preload to protect the system globally uh, and stop programs from running that are you know possibly malicious. And it can't be hacked like you know other leading enterprise EDR software. <laughs> well, did you just say that? You sound just like John McAfee right now. It can't be hacked, huh? <laughs> no, I'm saying that's the goal. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. <laughs> but you will have a chance. <laughs> you will have a chance to try to hack it tonight. I... All right. All right. Well, I'll get to that. You sound like everybody testifying against what they said about Trump. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say, I, I, I presume I didn't say that. <laughs> I thought about implying that I was going to insinuate it. <laughs> All right, so... <laughs> it was a missed tweet. <laughs> We've already discussed this part. Using LD preload to intercept the glibc wrappers for syscalls. We're going to s stand in the middle of every single user space program and any time that it tries to run a file or open a file or uh, same change permission bits or if it's... Uh, just gets the FD and it tries to execute that FD. There's many different functions, but we hook them all. Not the ones that cause high overhead. That will cause your Linux system to be very slow. Uh, so we don't hook like read and write. <laughs> that, that would turn your Linux system into a, you know, a frank or something. Let's just bring this right on down the user space. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So we're using LD preload here. Second, it's Libre. So I deliberately chose to license this as MIT. And so it is adaptable by any one of the major EDR so software companies. Uh, if they wanted to re-architect their software, <laughs> which might be a lot of effort for them, um, at the end of the day, they could use this principle and because it's kind of prior art now, uh, publish the source code, they can just go out and re-architect their software in a secure way. So now, instead of adding to the, foot, the, the uh, kernel footprint, they can use user space protection and uh, you know, adequately protect the user space from exploits. So yeah, it's, it's truly free, and that includes <coughs> closed source companies. So you know, it's, it's, it's completely free. Um, so it, it turns out, you know, I, I actually did do the research here, and there were no companies that use LD preload at this point. I I looked into it, and they all used either local kernel modules or they hooked into the hypervisor. So it's it's something that it's kind of a path that a lot of people haven't gone down because they, there's such a, like a negative connotation between LD preload. You know, and rip kits or reverse engineering, it's, just, it's kind of like hands off. But there are also people that don't understand it well enough to say we can actually use this as part of our architecture. So they, they think that, um, they think that, for example, you, one of the drawbacks for LD preload, if you're using it incorrectly, is you cannot hook statically compiled binaries. So if a program com is compiled with all libraries inside of it self-contained, it will not go to LD preload. But the problem there, and here's, here's the trick, because this is why no one made the software. They thought, okay, this is a huge vulnerability. You, you could just put a static binary on the system, run that, do anything. The problem that, with that is that 95% of everything on the Linux system is dynamically compiled. Mm -hmm. So that process that executes that static binary is already hooked. So before you even get the chance to run that, You've already, you've already crossed uh, the, the software's LD preload system once, so I already hooked that. So yeah, that, that's, that's, that's one way um, that it, it protects against um, statically compiled binaries. And uh, one of the other benefits of it being Libre is that I benefit from the many eyes principle. So, I mean, everyone can look over my source code and they can uh, decide what, whether or not, you know, for themselves, unlike any other vendor, which is, they're all proprietary, <laughs> except for a few open source projects, which all use local kernel modules. Um, you know, you can actually look through the source code yourself, decide whether or not it's secure before deploying it or anything. So, and one other thing here for Libre is that I, I also, um, I made a bug map, so I actually pay hackers $100, currently $100, to hack my software. Every time they do, I pay out. Uh, I've, I've given them actually tips in my source code. I've actually given them every weak point. I've identified my own source code. And I told them if they want to hack it, they can use it this way, this way, this way, this way. Like I, I try to help them make exploits against my software because at the end of the day, it makes my software better. How much have you paid? Uh, only once, only once, I, I <laughs> when I initially started the bug bounty program, I told some very skilled researchers about a possible vulnerability in it, and they went ahead and they took that to the proof of concept, and they had a, a uh, they called it white laser, the, the, the zero day <laughs> against it, and um, so I fixed that within a day, and then I gave them each 100 up. <laughs> Ducks would have been better. That would have been better. <laughs> <laughs> Each of them gets 100 ducks. <laughs> <laughs> Just tell me how you want to ship it. Well, you send the Quacker Library. <laughs> so, I chose to write it in Rust, which I had. A, it's a language I have no experience in. Uh, I, before I started, what? I came across Rust today. Go ahead. Yeah, Rust has a lot of benefits. So, one is cross architecture. So I can compile it for any architecture, which surprisingly you have like other things that 
you know, do compile, but they're not for every architecture. They're just for the main ones like x64 and um, you know, i386 and whatnot. So cross architecture and cross platform compa compatibility. Rust will compile for your binaries for every different uh, different different operating system. So hmm. Mac OS, Windows, and Linux. And and Temple OS. <laughs> Sorry, not yet. <laughs> we'll, we'll get there. Is, is sure the yeah. <laughs> Temple is still too shiny new for us. Yes. So is it oxidizable? The next thing, the next thing you're you're probably wondering is. Well, even if I can compile for every platform, you know, what's the? Can I actually get the same technique to work on every platform? Yes. So, this will work on Windows with a feature called AppInit DLLs. There's also a second one that will do the same equivalent functionality. On Mac OS, you have Dialog, which is the exact same thing as LDP Load, but for Mac. So. Because Mac. <laughs> yes, because so it's pretty Mac. <laughs> also, so, magically impenetrable viruses. Yes. I'm pretty sure they're actually <laughs> using their version of. of uh, it it, it works on unicorn farts. <laughs> <laughs> so, it runs cross platform, and when you think about it here, is this a single code base? So, I don't have to update three code bases. Every time I add a new feature to my software, this is one code base, all platforms. There's modular with if you're compiling on Windows, it compiles only the Windows side, includes that inside of the program. Mac, Win Linux, you know, it, it selectively compiles for your platform from one code base. So it's, it's, I think it's pretty well architected in that respect. Uh, it's also incredibly fast. My library, when I first, when I last benchmarked it, Executed in under one millisecond. It executed in 600 nanoseconds after uh, 20,000 different runs. So very, very fast library, and which is critical, right? I mean, you don't want to have a program that is in between, like every program on your system, and it being slow. <laughs> you're, you're never going to start your system, right? That's the problem with kids these days. You don't have to take the time. <laughs> I don't think back in my day. many people would agree. <laughs> So uh, another benefit of Rust is that it's safe. It doesn't have any of the unsafe functionality that, no, not, not just this. It's, no, it's, it's really safe. It guards against use of uninitialized memory, uh, double free pointers. Uh, it, it, it protects you against a lot of the classic binary exploit attacks. I think that was one of the tenets of their, their designs. They look yes. at all the flaws that, and all the damage you can do with C. And they're like, it wouldn't be C without the memory corruption. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so you wanted to do that too, but then I forgot. <laughs> no, it never got there. It was never on the agenda, really. So I, I'm kind of free of that, those those issues. Uh, but even if you were to compromise the <laughs> library, you're only getting the context of the library at the user space level. So you're not even gaining privileges at that point. You just exploited my own library, which gives you, sure, it might give you co-execution, but it's only as the user and not as roots or ring zero, you know, like it's, it's just the user context. So let's see what else I got here. So, yeah, and this is obviously versus current security software where it is one in root or user, uh, rather ring zero. Yeah. So you're trying to say this the right way. Certain versions of Microsoft products only had one level of security, and those are relatively old. Are you, depending on the security design of the operating system? Yes. Okay. Yes, these are. I'm um, depending on these two features on Windows. I haven't decided which mechanism I'm going to use yet, but I'm going to write just. Um, and basically hook into that functionality so that any program that's run on Windows, uh, it, it automatically calls my library for any of the inputted functions, which I can tell you offhand is admin and DLLs. I think it's a registry key that you set and it preloads it just kind of like how Linux does it with their hmm. Etsy uh, LD.so.preload. Yeah. 
Mac, he just had another vulnerability like that where it was loading, arbitrarily loading DLLs, wasn't it? All the McAfee softwares. They were arbitrarily loading DLLs and you could inject command execution into them. I didn't hear about that. Yeah, I think that was in the last two, three weeks. I make it a point to save all those articles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and undisclosed EDR also has the same issue. It's just like you can use LDP load to just completely subvert it. So, Joy. Anyway, um, and the last reason why I wrote it in Rust is because Hacker News upvotes anything written in Rust. So, <laughs> I've got the, got the mean potential of that. So, um, one thing I added today to the slide, because I just wanted to, to mention it, was that I'm using a hybrid crypto system. So what that means is that for, for hashing the files, for example, so when we run a file, we want to make sure that it's the file that we whitelisted, right? It's not some, someone just replaced the file at that path, and then you're running anything. So do you have any questions? No. Okay. So we want to hash the file. Well, that's only going to be as strong as the hashing algorithm that you use. If you use MD5, you're screwed, right? I mean, MD5 is broken cryptographically. There are literally programs that help you collide MD5 hashes for binaries. But I use, uh, I use two things. Um, I, my hybrid crypto system concatenates the old secure hashes with also post-quantum cryptography. So I use uh, the Kekak algorithm, the new SHA-3 NIST standard. And so I have the SHA-512 uh, hash, or rather SHA-256, uh, which is SHA-2, SHA-2 family. And then I concatenate that to the SHA-3 hash. So even if they have a quantum computer, <laughs> in theory, you know, um, and they could break the older SHA variants, they can't attack SHA-3, which is you know, using the, the newer lattice-based cryptography, completely different from the older uh, SHA-2 algorithm. So they would have to have vulnerabilities in both, both of the hashing algorithms. So that's part of the hybrid crypto system. The other part is talking to servers. I use, I use uh, the modern Diffie-Hellman handshake. Uh, besides that, I'm also considering implementing a, so it's on the roadmap. Um, there is a new post-quantum TLS standard that was released this year. Uh, latest update for that was this month. So I'm, I'm kind of waiting for the dust to settle in that respect. But it is a, it's a hybrid crypto system. It combines the traditional TLS, um, the traditional TLS crypto with also the, uh, the post-quantum SIDH, uh, the SIDH, uh, DH key exchange. So basically, it's 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 post quantum. Even if you have a quantum computer, you shouldn't be able to uh, decrypt the messages across the network, which probably wouldn't get you much anyway because of how I designed it. And I'll show you how I designed it in a second. But uh, yeah, this is one of the reasons why I chose to implement the post quantum stuff. <laughs> Uh, this is a news article from today, if anyone you guys read Echo News. Today? Yeah. Um, <laughs> don't, don't rush quantum proof encryption, warns NSA research director. So I think it's very important that people wait for NIST to do its due diligence. It's hard to predict what people will actually do with a quantum computer, says the NSA, which I'm sure has no quantum computer, right? <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't. They don't know. There's, you know, absolutely no actual quantum computer yet. So there is, quote unquote, the quantum supremacy stuff that that Google is working on, and they claim that they can um, that they can compute something faster than the classical equivalent, so faster than the um, the classical algorithm. I assume that the NSA is one step ahead for cryptography. Just a wild guess. <laughs> So I would assume that if there was any reason why you would not want to implement post-quantum cryptography, it would be at least in part motivated by the fact that you have a, a working proof of concept to decrypt certain quantum 
Well, I, I would, I would also guy. argue too with the whole heartbeat and the Verizon Prime that they just in IST is like, hey, use like these two prime numbers to factor with, and everybody's like, oh yeah, this one's good, okay, and they just use those. And oh yeah, by the way, we had the rainbow table with those. <laughs> so I'm aware of the NIST introduced vulnerabilities, yeah, and that is why I do not use the NIST specified constants, right? The elliptic curves or whatever. Yes. So they publish their constants, which are not, uh, they're not made by the community. They're standardized by, by NIST. And NIST is known to have introduced vulnerabilities in the past based on close NSA cooperation. I think it's funny that they have it listed here that says they are not directly involved in this competition, probably because they were kicked out at the beginning of round one because of their conflict of interest. <laughs> so, yes, that's probably why they were kicked out of that competition. <laughs> so, I thought it was really succinctly, you know, it's a great <laughs> analogy here. <laughs> Don't rush to improve the chicken coop. Where is local Fox? This sounds like Fox News. <laughs> okay. So, long story short, here is my design. Um, I'm going to put some sunglasses on for this one. It's the only slot I couldn't do live and late. But I have, you know, here's Bash. Bash loads the library. The library goes to SQLite, surprisingly. SQLite. Uh, and, and the reason why I chose SQLite here is because it's faster than the file system. I benchmarked it. <laughs> and wow. it blew my mind that SQLite loaded faster than a JSON parser. Have you tried Pied Piper? <laughs> so, I, I, after I benchmarked it, I'm like, you know, I have to go with whatever's faster. So, I went to, I, I have a database that it reads. Um, that database will actually have the, the, pass, the, the hash version of the password that you can authenticate as and administer the system without white beam getting in your way. Um, that hash because you don't know the plain text, it's actually safe to set that to an environment variable. And so even if the, the program gets that hash, it doesn't know what the plain text is, which is generated and expires at a certain time. And that's communicated with Pesetto, which is a new standard based on JSON web, JSON web tokens. If you've anyone heard of JSON web tokens? Yes. Yes. I've heard of that. Have you heard of JSON web encryption? Yeah. OK, Rich. So, I hear JSON is really well crystal processors. JSON web encryption is part of the HOSA family. It's like a um, it's like a standard, and the problem with HOSA is it specified really outdated or incorrect cryptographic algorithms. So it's like the community was like, "Oh, this is a great standard, but it has a lot of problems." So they came up with Pesetto, and the Pesetto is like this really easy to use. You want to use as much generic cryptography as possible when you implement any cryptographic program, right? Because if you use your own home-baked crypto, it's probably not going to stand up to the NSA. The NSA. <laughs> so I'm, I'm using as much standard uh, <coughs> technology as I can. And Pesetto is one of them. Um, I'm using, so it, it's actually, here's the, the key exchange. Um, you have the key of the server, and it what it does is it um, it, it requests the key. Um, there's two. There are, there are actually two different options here. I have the uh, open source version, and then I have kind of like a, like an enterprise IOC version of it. Um, either one works. Uh, each one does identical functionality. Just one doesn't have like a, a full console or anything. Um, so, yeah, basically, there's a fully signed uh, communication pathway here, and it's also confidential, which I can say that other enterprise leading <laughs> software oh, no. <laughs> does not properly encrypt things before it's being sent, so everything's sent across an network complaint text. So all that really important information that your EDR tools are collecting are being sent back over plain text? Yes. <laughs> and if you don't believe it, you can load up Wireshark and you can look. But it's, this actually solves that. This is, uh, I mean, like I said, this is like, what? It's not the air. It's a wide-through value preload. It's actually the air. 
Yeah, exactly. So this is all open. Uh, it doesn't trust the client at all. There's absolutely nothing secret on the client. So even if the client is totally compromised, you still can't do anything with it. Uh, that's the whole logic behind setting it up this way. There's no symmetric encryption here. Like it's not, there's no constant key on these hosts that once you get it, you can decrypt all the traffic cost network. This is set up so that each server has its own client key, which is securely transmitted. And you know, you, you identify the key, each server with the fingerprint of its key. And I, I did, you know, I, I analyzed it from many different angles. I did not see any way you could MITM this traffic, so man middle attack on this traffic. So it looks good to me. It's like a, like a chef or puppet. I like what? It's like chef or puppet where they have, each client has its own key and has its own identification. Does it really do it like that? I didn't know. Yeah. The only thing that might change in this design a little bit is the TCP socket that I use to connect to the Lightbeam uh, service. So I have a daemon that runs on the system persistently, and all it does is it just makes sure that everything is communicated up to the network and all the blocked executions are communicated to the people who need to know about them. But it does use like a service port, so I mean, I didn't want to have a daemon, but this is kind of like a necessity. I might use a Unix socket for speed purposes. Uh, so that might change a little bit, but I believe this is a secure design based on, um, you know, the amount of time I'd spent trying to create attacks on it. If there's anything that stands out to you guys, just let me know <laughs> now or after the presentation. <laughs> anything horrible? So I was actually kind of wondering, it's like um, LD preload, actually, is it, I was just reading about it because I didn't know about that file. Um, as it turns out, the loading order, it will actually allow the environmental variable to override the file. You are very, that's a very acute observation. And so he can read the main page. That <laughs> was, <laughs> I did it. I it. That was the one and only time that I did not read the man page <laughs> when I should have. So that was the, the vulnerability that I, I paid up the hack for. Oh, okay. Because, Damn, you almost paid a hundred dollars. You almost paid a hundred ducks. Yeah, you served a hundred ducks. Now, it's... You have an entire duck family. <laughs> yeah, he no longer gives a duck. And I don't, I, I don't have any ducks to give. <laughs> so, they specified the LD preload environment variable, which came before the system library, surprisingly, and that bypassed the EDR. Um, after I made sure to give them all the appropriate permission, the, the, basically the binaries that they needed to run to get the LNet on the system. So my patch for that is I now have it specified it in the whitelist, and the code for the whitelist it allows you to have a parameter. It says allow unsafe environment variables. And if you really want them, you can allow that to happen. Okay. So it's kind so of putting on the users, that. right? Like if, if they want to put themselves in a situation where they can get hacked, they can, but by default now it's secure. Very good. good, that's the only good, good point, really, that, that's the only vulnerability I had <laughs> so far. There you go. And that is why, er, only really? Only two in a hell of a long time. So anyway. There we go. <laughs> that is why I have this. <laughs> so, um, I actually went ahead and set up a <laughs> challenge server for you guys. If you're interested, or if you have time, you know, now or after the the presentation. I, this is not the end of my presentation, but uh, I have it up here now. So, if you want to connect to the server and try to bypass my software, you are welcome to do so. It is, you know, here's the the SSH login credentials. It's running a version of Wiping that I published, uh, I would say, a few months ago. Um, I just made the newest release today, which is 0.0.9. .0 I don't use semantic versioning. I use the versioning that makes it seem like I, I really thought this through when, I <laughs> when I've been developing it. It's like, oh, you found a vulnerability in 0.0.6. That's nothing. <laughs> um, no, but I've actually been developing this for about seven or eight months now. So, I mean, maybe maybe the eight is like a, you can indicate that as months. <laughs> so anyway, um, 
I'll have an example here. What? Good question. Are you okay with this going up on YouTube right now? <laughs> <laughs> My hope is that it doesn't blow up or anything. I haven't announced it. This, is, this is your, your pre-release kind of preview of what I've been developing. And, uh, <coughs> so I'm not recommending that everyone goes out and tells everyone about it right now. I just want to have some kind How of How do chance. I know if I've broken it? By running a binary that's not approved. Oh, yes. So there is a, <coughs> there is a binary at forward slash chal, C-H-A-L. And if you run that, you bypass my EDR. And I have a demonstration here. Well, there's nothing in slash chow. No, it is a, it's a binary. So it's in the forward slash directory. Okay. I could just verify. It's called drive. slash chow. Yeah. C-H-A-L. Do you see it now? You're using JSSH. LS slash chow. Or just do LS slash. Did you do it wrong? Good. Good. <laughs> I'm not crazy. It's not a directory, it's just a file. Yeah, so it's, a binary. Binary. it's a binary. It's binary. And you can see that you have permission to run that, that binary too. If you can run that binary, okay. Okay. that's the goal. Okay, okay, now, I thought it was in a directory called slash. Yeah. No, Whitebeam should stop you from running that. Right, and you have permissions to run it. You have all the effective capabilities to run that file. The only thing that's stopping you is my library. And, um, by the way, if any of you did this at the NS meeting or you know even afterwards, I, I, I actually can't prepare it here. I've got 100 bucks. <laughs> <It's gonna laughs> <myself. laughs> I will pay. Despite how bad that's going to look, I will still pay you for hacking. That's your logging last night. So I'm going to show you some of the, uh, the logging that was in 0 .0 0 0.0.7. So here's my. Zero cool. Yeah. Okay, so here's an example here. So I'm running the whitelisted binaries, and then this is not on the whitelist, and it returns permission denied. So you can see what Whitebeam sees here. I have the hash, the SHA3 hash, and it's deciding whether or not it's permitted or not. Um, you can see the executions that are being intercepted, even crons being intercepted. Risky a little bit with systemd. Apparently systemd was intercepted. I had to kind of make a fix for that. Because <laughs> the system would not boot at all. <laughs> so there's a permissive mode for about five minutes. Um, when, you spark, when you boot the system, because you can just as easily you know, get global physical access as well. Uh, here's the schema for the SQLite table. Um, this was an earlier version, like I said. Uh, all the, you can see it's logs table, and you can see uh, it let you run ID once or twice. That's, those are true values, one and one. And when I tried to run top, it returned false. So it did not let you run top, as I demonstrated a little bit earlier. How fast did the uh, logs compile up on this, like, How space issues from oh. logging every execution of every program? So, as I said, I, I've only worked on this for a while, the idea here is that when I have it implemented, I'm going to ship the logs to yes. the management server, whatever it is, and those that's going to truncate the table, and it's going to start from nothing again, so we're not okay. going to have any space issues. All right. That's the hope. I don't want to lose any logs, but you know, if, if it becomes a problem, I can set like a hard limit for a certain amount of logs, and then it'll you know slowly rotate them out. So I actually had one more question, which was the, um, it creates a hash of the binaries that you're allowed to run to prevent the possibility of like overwriting a file and then, you know, being able to run it because the whitelist points to it. How does this deal with updates going forward, replacing those files? Great question. Excellent question. Yeah. Hey, hey, I mean, these are all good questions because I've had to think through all these. Um, so as far as updates go. Um, there is a, as I mentioned uh, a little bit earlier, there is a, um, in this mechanism here, you have uh, authentication to, to the client. And what that means is it just checks to see whether or not your, your password will match the hash as provided as ephemerally to the client. And you, you will be able to administer the server without any whitelisting. So 
when you set an environment variable on Linux, it's actually passed down to the children of that process. So if I set an environment variable that says, okay, uh, wipe beam auth, wb auth, it will pass it down to the children, and the children will look at that, they'll compare it to the hash that's stored in the, the database, and it will decide whether or not you can run it, and uh, if, if you're allowed to run the binary based on your authorization, uh, which is set to expire at a certain point, so obviously you can't use it forever, but um, that will allow you to run full updates on the system because all those processes that you run will be forked off of your parent process. But would you would you have to redo the entries for the whitelisting at that point with the new binaries to get the new hashes? Or so I'm thinking I'm going to do this like this. So I'm going to have my daemon periodically check in a thread the most recent versions of those files and. I'm also going to prohibit overwriting the whitelisted files so that someone can't just, you know, update it and then have it have the regular system update it. Um, so I'm I'm locking down the files, and with when, when you have this permissive mode, the authorized mode, you're able to update everything seamlessly. Uh, when it's not, you can't overwrite the files. No updates can take place. So as far as scheduled updates go, you'd have to use the management uh, interface, and you just say like you know, run this command on all the hosts, and it will pass down that authorization so you can automate the updates. Does that make sense? The white beam all. So you yes. can do the updates, and then, yeah, like I said, I'm, I guess I'm still a little confused with, because like you said, it was keeping a database that would keep the hashes of the actual files, right. so those are going to get replaced probably during the updates. So you, right. Okay, so was that the automated part that you're talking about where it would just keep refreshing that? Yes, it, uh, it refreshes it and the only authorized processes that can overwrite it are, so the only, file, the only authorized processes are either they have the environment variable set to the password which is then hashed and compared against the one that's stored in the database and obviously checks the timestamp but also the, another way of it, it being authorized is it goes through the daemon itself. The daemon is permitted at all times to modify files on the file system like the database. So those are two authorized ways of doing it and it can be automated just passing the, the correct environment variable that's generated from the server. Okay. And those are signed, I believe. Yes, they're signed when they're transmitted to the place. Any other questions about the design? Okay, so I have a few references here. References here for the uh, the repository. You can take a look on GitHub if you. Could I get the user and password for the thing again, please? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm gonna have that up for a while after. Cool presentation. So everyone can try. I'm, I'm gonna call in a ringer. <laughs> Sir. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if, if he's across the internet, I can PayPal or Venmo. Uh, so I'll take his payment. <laughs> I've, had some, I've had some pretty sophisticated guys hack this already. Like they, I've had, I would say, a combined total of about 40 or 50 years of experience try to hack my software, and the only exploit that's been created so far is that one, you know, mix up in the ordering of which is loaded first, but now it will check to see whether or not you have that defined and make sure that the ordering is correct. So, oh, I'd rather it will just deny you from running it to begin with. So, <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, references for Jinx, that what hackers wrote. Um, if you have any feedback, ideas, or suggestions that you don't want to bring up in today's meeting, uh, you can go ahead and email me. I've got this uh, security at whitebeamsec.com. I'm, I'm working on, so I have an automated build process now, so it's, it's rolling out the latest, the latest packages for uh, they're compiled for the 64-bit platforms. No other architectures yet, because I just don't have a build server up for them. But um, yeah, I, I'm I'm still working on automated. Don't put it on your systems right now. <laughs> if you if you value you know not having a so brick system, um, I I've carefully staged the environment so that it's running safely. But I I'm I still have like another week until I have the dynamic whitelist kind of fleshed out fully so that you can configure it after it's set up. 
Otherwise, you have nothing except for bashing wiping to run, and that's going to get really boring. <laughs> so yeah, thank you for coming. Thanks for letting me talk here. And I hope you